guide that's near you. Uh, we'll notice some announcements. We've got some uh, seats right there. There's some two, two kind of rows right there, fellas. Glad you're here today. And uh, just notice a few announcements. Uh, mainly, uh, I want to just announce our, our meeting with um, John Van Geldren. Uh, he's going to be preaching this morning. He already preached a wonderful message at 10 o'clock. He's going to be preaching again tonight at 6 p.m. Now, I know that we're all in here. We're like, uh, many of us, you love, you love football, you love the 49ers, and uh, I know there's other teams in here as well. But uh, I'd, I'd really ask you to just pray about uh, just, you know, just giving tonight to the Lord. You give, them, give tonight to the Lord and to be here at 6 o'clock. And maybe John will talk a little bit more about uh, the specific message that he's going to be uh, bringing. And I'm excited about that. And that's 6 o'clock. There will be no, uh, just no, no real refreshments tonight. We're just going to kind of come in. We're going to begin singing, and we're going to get right into the message, because we know we've got uh, many more days of the week of meetings, and that's on Monday night and Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Come early, because there will be refreshments. We'll have meatballs, salad, uh, cheese, and some dessert items, and uh, some coffee, hot chocolate, and water, things like that. And uh, so then we'll, we'll look forward to uh, then getting right into uh, the singing and then into the preaching, and uh, I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do. And then you can see some other upcoming events there. I won't take a lot of uh, time here this morning with that. We had a great uh, kind of first uh, teen activity of the year uh, this Friday night and uh, went bowling and had a great time. Uh, but our next one is going to be on that Saturday, if you look at the bottom there, on February 19th. We'll have a men's prayer breakfast at 7 a.m. Uh, for you fellas over at Stacks here in Redwood City. It opens at 7, so we'll walk right in and get a choice of uh, tables, and then we'll also have a teen activity that day. We're going to do some hiking and then barbecue at my house. So mark your calendar for that day. You can see the next home groups and just uh, an exciting month ahead. But uh, really, it's all about tonight, Monday night, and Tuesday night, and I really pray that you will uh, do your very best to uh, participate in those meetings. Well, Brother Van Gelman, this is his third time here with us, and uh, so over the course of the last... Uh, four years or so. Uh, he's been here every other year, and uh, he was here right before uh, COVID started two years ago. And I think you gave it to us, brother. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you gave us a good dose of the spirits, which you gave us, and uh, I'm still uh, loving what you uh, preached on last year and uh, two years ago. And so uh, he's just become a dear friend. Uh, for those of you that have been in our church, I know many of you. You found our church even uh, during COVID, and we're thankful that you're here and that we can uh, worship together this morning. Uh, but uh, he's become a dear friend of our ministry and uh, my family, and it's been a joy to spend even just the last uh, few days with you and uh, just to kind of get to know their heart. And Mary Lynn, his wife, is uh, just a dear uh, friend of Sarah, and thank you. And then your son is at Pensacola mm -hmm. in Florida and college, and so you keep them in prayer. Uh, as they're just kind of in this new uh, life stage of getting to travel the, the world and the country just alone. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, but you pray for them and pray for yourselves that God would uh, do a mighty work. And so uh, after we sing a few more songs and you lead us in prayer, Mike, and then John, you come and uh, bring the word at that time. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and sing here. Our next song this morning, Behold Our God. Let's sing it here this morning. Rising. 
God for that. Every Sunday we get to do that, but every single day you can go and adore the Lord in prayer and reading his word. But let's continue here this morning. As we have revival in mind, the song fits perfectly well. So let's see out here. We take our lives. You take. James chapter 4 in your Bibles this morning. Going to the New Testament book of James chapter 4. Good to be back here 
And uh, may the Lord breathe on us in these days. I know that many of you have prayed leading up to this meeting. Let me encourage you, now that we've begun, would you continue to pray? Because we'll always need that touch that we just sang about, the presence of God. God's omnipresent, but there's a difference when He manifests that presence so that we're aware that God is in the room. And uh, there's something about that that allows the Word to sink in much deeper. And so uh, let's ask the Lord to meet with us in that way and to uh, so quicken us and so move even in the atmosphere that the truth, the Word of God, has free course and it's given its full weight to come down on our hearts. And uh, let me encourage you to keep praying that way. And I do trust that you'll come every service that the Holy Spirit wants you to come. And if we'll look to them, him about that, he'll guide us. Let me have my wife stand up. Uh, 36 years now married. I'm Mary Lynn, and uh, she's put up with me. <laughs> and we're going on 37 years this uh, uh, May. But uh, good to have uh, well, uh, her traveling with us. Last year, my son did a gap year, and so they were home. So I did a lot of meetings by myself. So it really is good <laughs> uh, to have her back with me. My son, as he uh, mentioned, Pastor mentioned, is uh, in college. Uh, and he's really bummed he's missing out on California. But nonetheless, uh, we are uh, delighted to be here. And may the Lord uh, make this time count. So appreciate the heart of your pastor and his desire to see God work. Uh, we've seen what man can do. We need to see what God can do. And so uh, that is uh, the passion of your pastor. We've had a delightful time together already. Looking forward to the fellowship in these next couple of days as well. Well, James chapter 4 in the Word of God this morning. Now, Lord willing, tonight we're going to deal with the truth that the Lord really brought to bear in my own heart in the summer of 2020, so very recent, and it's a marvelous truth. It just rocked my boat in a very uh, helpful way, and uh, we will look at that tonight. But this morning, I want us to look at a truth that began my journey back, uh, oh my, uh, 30 years ago. And so, uh, uh, James chapter 4, in the Word of God, this morning, James chapter 4, and let's look at verse 6. But he, that's God, giveth or gives more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth, resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Friends, this verse is loaded. When it says in the first phrase that he giveth more grace, the word more comes from a Greek word that if I were to, well, I'll just say it, it's the term megas, and you get the idea. It's mega. The text is actually saying God gives mega grace. Now, we live in a time when there's mega stores and mega churches and mega this and mega that. I'm going to tell you what we need is mega grace, and God's giving it. So I want to speak this morning on the truth of mega grace. Lord, I pray that you would take this truth, open it up to our hearts in a way where faith is nurtured to the point that there is a glad faith response. Lord, where needed, would you do a life-changing work? Lord, where needed, may it be a turning point, a pivotal moment for some today so that months from now, there will be ongoing radical transformation. Lord, for others who've already been blessed by this truth, may they be refreshed in this truth, deepened in it, renewed in it. Lord, would you do today for each one what needs to be done, Lord? We need that touch from heaven. We're asking you for it. Lord, may we not just go through the motions of a service. Lord, breathe on us. Lord, work in every heart so that there's an upturned face looking to you to hear from you. And would you speak to each heart and may they know it. I do plead the blood of Jesus, Lord, through the victory of the cross to protect us from Satan's attack. And may the victory of Jesus, when he said it is finished, be manifest even now over the world, the flesh, and the devil. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. My father was a reader. In fact, by every chair that he would sit on, there was a chair that was his kind of chair, you know, in the living room. There was another chair in the family room. Uh, and, you know, wherever his chair was, he had a stack of books. And if no conversation was going on, that hand would go down. He'd take one of those books and he would read. He was just, uh, he was well read on every subject. You could talk to him about any subject, hist uh, history, medicine, anything. And uh, he, uh, he was well read. Now, I was not a reader. <laughs> I played ball. You know, I, I did other things. I was not a reader until the event that I'm about to tell you. Then God radically 
changed that. You say, how did it begin? Well, I was an assistant to my dad for five years. Toward the end of that five-year period, I was just getting ready to enter full-time evangelism uh, in uh, January of 1992, so literally 30 years ago. Uh, my dad asked me that fall to read the two-volume biography. Now, I'm not a reader. <laughs> and he asked me to read the two-volume biography of Hudson Taylor. Now, each volume was 500 pages. I mean, each volume was like bigger than anything I've ever read, you know. Uh, I had never read a two-volume anything at that point in my life except the Old and New Testaments. <laughs> and uh, so when it came to other books, you know, I just didn't. I read the Bible, but uh, I didn't read much of the other books. I read what I had to to get through school. Even grad school is amazing how little. In fact, when I was in systematic theology, we'd have to turn in these reports. You know, you had to read systematic theology books. Oh, my goodness. And uh, <laughs> these guys, you know, you got all the nerds in the class, they're reading, they're turning in like 25 hours, you know, 21 hours, 19 hours. I'm turning in like an hour and 45 minutes. So then I have to bust my gut and, you know, ace the test to make up for the, the loss of the grade <laughs> on the uh, reading. But at any rate, uh, so that's just where I was. So here I, I got, you know, what am I going to do? Dad, but, you know, well, this is my dad at the time he was my boss. I'm stuck. I got to read this. Well, it didn't take long, and I got engrossed in what I was reading and the story of Hudson Taylor. And at the same time in the providence of God, it's amazing how God brings so many facets to bear at the same time. Only God can do this. At the same time, I was, I was using a, a, a study Bible called the Inductive uh, Study Bible by K. Arthur. And uh, in this Bible, it teaches you the inductive method. And then instead of reading somebody else's comments, uh, like you typically do in a in study Bible, and there's a great place for that, in this case, you develop your own notes through the inductive method. So I was in Galatians and Ephesians during the same time period where I'm really diving into Hudson Taylor's life. And in the inductive method, you're noting words that occur often. You're seeking to find out why. And in Galatians and Ephesians, I began to notice for the first time in my life that the word grace, a very familiar word, I'm a PK, uh, but I, I began to notice that that word was all over those books. That the pages of the little books of Galatians and Ephesians were loaded with the word grace. And I began to notice that it was not just dealing with justification. It was dealing with sanctification. And God began to open my eyes. It's the first time I saw it. Now I got saved at 6, called to preach at 15, first, first message at 16 and so forth. But for the first time I began to see the need for grace, not just to go to heaven, but to experience heaven on earth. And the futility of the flesh and the necessity of the Spirit of God to impart grace for everything. And I'm going to tell you, it was a great awakening. It really was a grace awakening in the truest sense of that word. It launched me, it rocketed me on a revival journey. It began then, and of course, God in his goodness continues us on that pathway for the rest of our lives. It launched a revival journey. Now, let God launch you, if needed, on a revival journey this morning through understanding and applying and experiencing mega grace. Now, what is grace? Why do we need mega grace? And if that is, in fact, the case, which it is, how do we access this mega grace of God? So, let's look at three truths that answer those three questions. First of all, the definition of grace. Let's start by answering the first question, what is grace? Now, when I was a little boy, a lot of the churches in our land had what they called training union. They had Sunday school in the morning before the morning service, and they had training union in the evening before the evening service. That was just the order of the day uh, back in the 1960s. I hate to date myself here, but I just did. Uh, so when I was a little kid, uh, we would have that. Now, in, in training union, or if for that matter, in Sunday school, if, if the teachers uh, would have asked when I was a little kid, you know, in elementary school, what is grace? Boy, I could have shot my little hand up in the air. I usually didn't. I was too shy. But I could have because I knew the answer, uh, and that was that standard answer, unmerited favor. How many of you knew that? that grace is unmerited or undeserved favor. I could have said that. Unmerited favor. Now, if the teacher would have followed up and asked, what is the unmerited favor? <laughs> I'd have been absolutely stumped. See, that's what we want to get to. 
We've got to go beyond, beyond the surface here. What is this unmerited favor? What really are we talking about? Now, the key to understanding definitions of words in any language, including biblical language, is the usage of the term. And there are some words that the Holy Spirit uses in a way that's even different from the way that word was used at that time period. Now, sometimes it's the same, uh, but sometimes God is taking a, a common word and then he's adding a spiritual meaning to it. And that's why in 1 Corinthians, it tells us that we need to compare spiritual concepts with spiritual words. Because some of these words, God's attaching a meaning to, like the word abide over in John. And this is what we have here with this word grace. We need to take the effort to see how the Holy Spirit uses the word. Now, sometimes the Bible just gives it a, a definition in one verse, like sin is the transgression of the law. But with grace, we don't have that. But we need not fear because this word is used all over the uh, pages of Scripture, and we can glean from that and discern a very specific definition. So, let's just piece it together. First of all, the nature of grace is a gift. In our text itself, it says, He, God, gives more grace. So that means to us as the receiver, it is a gift. The nature of grace is a gift. If you know Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. That's true in salvation. It's also true in sanctification, where in Ephesians 3, verse 7, in a sanctification context, it says the gift of the grace of God. So very clearly, grace, the nature of grace is a gift. That means for us as the receiver, we do not earn it. Ah, so there's the unmerited part of this. Someone else earned it for us. For us as the receiver, we do not purchase it. You know, we live in an American culture. We just want something. You purchase it, okay? Can't do that with grace. Jesus purchased it for us. For us as the receiver, grace is in very fact absolutely free. It's a gift. The nature of grace is a gift. Secondly, the source of grace is God. The text says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You see, the source is God himself. He's the one who earned. He's the one who purchased through Jesus. You see, grace is not something you and I manipulate it is not something we produce. Now, God can work in us so that graciousness flows out to others, but it's still coming from Him. <laughs> you see, the source of all grace in the Bible sense is God. It's divine. It is supernatural, not natural. So, the nature of grace is a gift. Secondly, the source of grace is God. Thirdly, we come to the core. The essence of grace is supernatural enablement. Now, this is what God began to show me in the beginning of my journey that was just so life-changing. The essence of grace is supernatural enablement. In other words, what's the unmerited favor? What's the favor? Okay, that's what we're coming to here with the supernatural enablement. For example, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7, I referenced it a moment ago, but the Apostle Paul writes under inspiration in verses 7 and 8 and says, Whereof I was made a minister or a preacher by the gift of the grace of God given unto me, then he's going to give us a defining phrase, by the effectual working of his power. Now, the two words effectual working come from one word. If we were to transliterate it into our English language, it would sound like the word energy. Now, it's not always true that when you transliterate from one language to another, that what it sounds like is what it means. It sometimes is, but not always. But it is true in this case. Paul was saying, look, I was made a preacher. How was that? It was by the gift of God's grace given unto me. How was that? It was by the energy of God. And all of a sudden, as I was studying this, God began to open my eyes. There is an ability available beyond human ability because I wasn't doing very well on the human ability stuff. You know, I was really trying hard to be, you know, the best kid in the block and all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't happening. <laughs> and, uh, you know, wow, that there is this ability available that, that is beyond human ability. You see, it's supernatural ability. It's supernatural energy. It is grace. That's what it is. 
Galatians 2, 8, and 9 gives us the same sense in many other passages, but let's go to the fourth aspect. The nature of grace is a gift. The source is God. The essence is supernatural enablement. That's core. Number four, the agent of grace is the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews 10, 29, he's called the Spirit of grace. Have you ever wondered why in the epistles often it says grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, and it doesn't name the Spirit? Well, he's not a second-class citizen in the Godhead. He's in the word grace. Grace to you, the spirit of grace to you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah. You see, he is the agent of the Godhead who brings to bear this supernatural energy. He is the person of God who brings the power from the throne of God and streams that very life-giving power right into your being. Now, a lot of churches have started using live streaming because of COVID. It's been a good thing. You know, God had it figured out a long time ago. <laughs> and it's better than live streaming. It's life streaming. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, where the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, brings that very life of Jesus from the throne right into you. See, it's supernatural enablement. It's the Spirit imparting to you the very life of Jesus. You see, salvation is not just getting you to heaven. It's getting Jesus into you. And it starts the moment you believe on him as Savior, but then there's this provision. He moved in, not just to be hidden, but to be manifested and to be experienced. And so, the agent of all of this, grace, is the Holy Spirit. Then number five, the purpose of grace is to do God's will. The purpose is to do God's will. Obviously, that starts with getting saved. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, uh, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. Okay, it's God's will that everybody gets saved, but not everybody gets saved because you got to respond in faith or you miss out, but it is by grace. I already mentioned Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, but for by grace are you saved through faith. So there's the man's responsibility. Faith is not a work. It's dependence on Jesus to do the work. He's the Savior. He died on the cross. Your sin was put on him so that his righteousness could be put on you. But it is by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of human works, lest any man should boast. You see, salvation is not you being good enough to get to heaven. The standard for heaven is God. Yeah, you're not good enough. It's by grace. That's where it all starts, but then it continues with what theologians call sanctification. That's the life of becoming holy, becoming like Jesus because you're accessing Jesus. Not you and I trying to imitate him. We'll never come close. It's the Spirit imparting his very life to us. See, that's grace. Now, here's what the Bible says in this regard. One of many passages, Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, so what does it teach us? That denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Ah, huh? that's possible because of grace. It teaches us this mega grace, this supernatural enablement that's available through the Spirit teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. It's not just a matter of, bless God, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to live like the devil down here. <laughs> no. <laughs> God moved in, so you don't have to live like the devil down here. And every time we ignore God, guess what we do? We live like the devil. We really do. Do you know there's only two wills? There's God's will and there's Satan's will. You say, what about my will? Our will either sides with God's will or Satan's will at any given moment. And even as a child of God, when, when we don't yield to the will of God, we're yielding to the will of Satan. Whoa. We don't call it that, but that's exactly what it is. See, Satan tries to deceive us, according to Ephesians chapter 2, to try to make us think that it's our will. I'm just doing what I want. You know, I'm this independent thinker, blah, blah, blah. You are deceived. <laughs> No human being is an independent thinker because you're either siding with God's will or Satan's will. And Satan tries to make you think that you're this big shot, that you got this thing figured out, and you can just, you know, be this independent thinker with when the fact is when you do that, you just bought into his will. You're duped. See, 
But it doesn't have to be that way. Because grace not only saves us so that we have a new destiny, destiny and we're on our way to heaven. Grace is the power of that Jesus brought right into our being where the Spirit literally brings the life of Jesus from the throne right into us so that as we yield to His will and we access this grace, then that's where there's the power to say no and deny ungodliness and worldliness, not in our strength but in His, and so that we can live godly and righteously in this present evil world. Wow. Titus 2, 11 and 12. See, grace is greater than our sin. Grace is never an excuse to sin. That's the misuse of grace, and there's a lot of that. Grace is greater than our sin. It's to enable in us, so, us so that we can keep from sin as we experience the holy life of Jesus. That's part of grace. That's God's will. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification, first. Thessalonians 4 tells us. And so, this will of God, how does, it, how does it happen? How can we live holy in California in 2022? Doesn't matter if you're in California or anywhere in the world, folks. <laughs> the only way is grace. Grace. Supernatural enablement. Where the Holy Spirit is imparting to you the holy life of Jesus so that you are denying ungodliness and living godly because you're accessing God. Oh, that's how this works. That's beautiful. And not only is grace, uh, when we see the purpose of grace to do God's will, it's not only God's will to get saved, it's not only God's will to live holy this side of heaven, it's God's will to live for God, to serve Him as we sometimes use that word. You know, Paul said, in that great resurrection gospel chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And he said, I labored in the gospel, that service, more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. You see, just like we need not I, but Christ for holy living, we need not I, but Christ, which is the same truth as not I, but grace, for service. That's the power. To win people to Christ, it's not based on how witty you are and whether or not you got the right personality to witness. It's based on the Spirit of God enabling you so that the truth of the gospel has power even though you speak it stuttering. That's how it works. You see, it's all by grace. So let's put it all together. It's the supernatural enablement through the Holy Spirit to do God's will. That's what we just saw. That implies that it's, yes, this unmerited favor, but the favor is the supernatural enablement through the Holy Spirit to actually do God's will this side of heaven. That is grace. His life for His will. His power for His wisdom. That brings us now to the demand of grace. Let's go to the second question. Why do we need mega grace? If the Bible says that God is giving, present tense, continually giving, mega grace... You know what that means by implication? We need it. We don't just need a little bit of grace. We need big time grace. Like really big time. Mega. It's in the text. Because apart from God's supernatural enabling, we tend to make big messes. Mega messes. And that's why we need mega grace. You see... It's the failure of our flesh that starts with salvation. You know, you and I, we can't earn our way to heaven. The religions of the world, it doesn't matter what label they are, are you got to somehow be good enough to get to heaven on your own. Oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross. Sometimes some religions will say, but you know, you got to be good too. Okay, God wants us to live right, but that's not how you get to heaven. You know why? The standard for heaven is God. And guess what? None of us come close to meeting that standard. Did you know that only God meets the standard of God? That's why we need a Savior. That's why Jesus went to the cross. It's because we can't save ourselves. Good as we may try, we fall short of the glory of God. We don't even come close. In our arrogance, we think we may, 
But we don't. Only God meets the standard of God. That's why we need to put our faith in Jesus. And when you stop depending on yourself and you transfer your dependence to Jesus alone to actually save you, at that moment your sins are forgiven and the righteousness of Jesus is put on your account so that legally his righteousness is what God sees and God meets the standard of God. And not only that, he gives you his very own eternal life. And eternal life is not something, according to 1 John 1, 2, eternal life is someone God moves into you. That's where it all starts. Just in a meeting a couple of weeks ago in St. Louis and a dear young lady, at the end of the service raised her hand, I don't know Jesus yet. He's never moved in. We talked afterwards. She says, I'm, I'm being prepared. <laughs> And she was the last several weeks. God was opening her eyes. Her, her saved uh, brother, only been saved for a few months himself, was witnessing to her and so on. And there she was. She goes, I want to be. She says, I just don't know how. We explained what faith is. Faith is not a work. It's just casting your dependence on Jesus to save you. It's like getting off of one chair and putting your weight down on the Jesus chair, trusting him to do the saving. And at that moment, her eyes were opened and she bowed her head and admitted to God that she was a sinner that deserved hell, but knowing Jesus saved, she transferred her dependence to Jesus to apply his saving work to her once and for all, and at that moment, she was saved by grace. That's where it starts. But the demand for grace goes beyond the failure of our flesh for salvation. There's also the failure of our flesh, our strength, our own self-effort for victory. Now, I got saved at six years old. I'm a preacher's kid. I've been in church thousands upon thousands of times. <laughs> I should go back and try to figure out how many services I've been in in 59 years. <laughs> That's a lot of them, I'll tell you that. Oh, my. But you know, in my early years, though I was saved, somehow I missed this grace thing. Now, my dad understood it. He lived it. And I even go back to my notes where I wrote down what Dad said. You know how he defined grace? Supernatural enablement. This is long before I understood it at 30 years of age. Back, back years before I'm writing it down. But you know what? It went right over my head. You say, why did it go over your head? Well, here's why it goes over any of our heads. As long as we're content with ourselves, who needs God? Now, we would never say it that arrogantly, but that's what we do. We think, well, I can do church, I can do this, I can do that, I cannot do this, I cannot do that. Look, you're missing it. <laughs> Unsafe moralists can do that. And there are some good ones. They look good. But they're not on the way to heaven because they don't have Jesus. And see, only God meets the standard of God. That's not just true in justification where we need imputed righteousness. It's true in sanctification where we need imparted righteousness. Only God meets the standard of God. And so I was one of those that was trying to live for God in the strength of man. I was trying to live the Christian life without the Christian life himself. He had moved in, but I was ignoring him and trying to just imitate Christianity. And so that's where I was. But in this moment when my dad asked me to read that two-volume biography, I'll come back to that story now. And I'm in that study and grace is coming off the page, supernatural enablement, and it's not just for justification, it's for sanctification. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I needed that because the sanctification thing wasn't going so well. You know, I could fake it on the surface. You know how that goes. But how ah, about all the other stuff? And so uh, I'll never forget this. We're now, I had entered full-time evangelism. I was a slow reader, so, <laughs> so months are going by, you know, and all this is happening. And my wife and I were in our first year of ministry, and I was in a little church. had six rows. And uh, uh, they had just suffered, this is terrible, they had suffered a church split because they had put in new carpet, and half the audience did not like the color. True story. I will say it was a bright bubblegum pink, but <laughs> that's not what you should leave a church over. <laughs> so one day my wife's practicing the piano. It's daytime. I'm sitting on the front row and I got, I'm now in volume two <laughs> of the biography. In fact, it may have been February if I'm thinking right, 93 by this point. And all of this truth is coming together. And for the first time in my life, I began to recognize the futility of the flesh and the necessity of the spirit. 
Only God meets the standard of God. And therefore, the futility of flesh or self-dependence and the necessity of God dependence. And the futility of a flesh-filled life, even if it's religious-looking flesh. And the necessity of a spirit-filled life. And I'm telling you, when that began to just open up, I began to realize, wait a second, I've been missing out. And I began to see for the first time that the flesh profits nothing. Whoa, that was like massive, monumental, because I was working hard with this flesh thing. I was trying to do right. You know, give me the box, I'll get in it. Give me the list, I'll add to it, I'll outperform. So I thought. <laughs> and, uh, and then I began to realize, wait a second, the flesh profits nothing? It's unprofitable? It's a waste? It's what it says. It's what it says. Jesus said, without me, ye can do. It's amazing how much sweat we can put in doing nothing. <laughs> nothing that counts. Because only when you access Jesus does it count. Everything else goes up in the smoke. Whatever's not Christ but us at the judgment seat gets incinerated. 1 Corinthians 3. Whatever's not I but Christ, oh, that's what passes. God meets the standard of God. And I began to realize, wait a second, I've been trying to do this on my own. This isn't going to pass the test. And not only that, I saw in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, that the Spirit gives life. And that the letter of the law kills. Well, I was really good at this letter of the law stuff. I was killing everybody. <laughs> oh, man. And I began to realize, you know what? I'm not even helping. I'm hurting. You talk about a great awakening. That not only is what you're doing a waste, it's hurting people. Because when the Spirit of God's not in it, it's death. That's what the next verse in 1 Corinthians 3, 7 says. That the law without the Spirit is a ministry of death. It's con condemnation. We're going to see why tonight. An amazing passage. But friends, oh, God began to open my eyes. And look where you're at, prophets, nothing. It's counterproductive. It's deadening. You're hurting people because a lot of what you do isn't, isn't me. Now, not everything. There's a few times when I would get so desperate I would accidentally happen into faith. <laughs> Did you catch that? <laughs> that sometimes we can get so desperate, we just, God, you got to help me. And so we accidentally happen into faith not knowing what's going on. But you know, most of the time we're not that desperate and we're prone to wander right back to self-dependence. And God was showing me, look, it profits nothing, it's counterproductive. In fact, God calls it sin. Romans 14, 23 says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of God dependence. Well, if it's not God dependence, it's us. It's self-dependence. It's man dependence. It's flesh dependence. Whether it's your flesh or the flesh of somebody else, it's just all man propping each other up. God says, whatsoever is not of faith, whatsoever is not of God dependence is sin. Sin. And I'm sitting on the front row of this little auditorium. Marilyn's practicing this piano. And all of this is coming together. It wasn't just that I needed grace. I was, I was living in sin. The religious, self-dependent, living in sin kind of problem. Wow, I didn't know that was a problem. <laughs> Till that day when God opened my eyes. Wait a second. You're trying to live righteously without the righteous one? Who do you think you are? Wow, I'm going to tell you it was a great awakening, but I thank God for it because that's what launches you back to God. It's what launches you back to grace. So the demand for grace is the failure of our flesh in both salvation and sanctification and, of course, everything else, service and so on. But let's get to the third truth, the deliverance through grace. Now let's come to that final question, how do we access grace? Well, let's go back to our text. It says, he gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud. Let me stop right there. The word resist is a fascinating word. In fact, it's a military term. Indicating that God stations himself against the proud. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want God stationed against me. You know, a lot of times we come up against resistance and we say it's the devil. Could be, but maybe it's not. Maybe you're just arrogant and trying to live the Christian life without Jesus and God's resisting you to awaken you to get back to Jesus. That's what he was doing to me. <laughs> wow. 
God resists the proud. There's the obvious pride of self-will, doing our own thing, doing what we want, indulging our flesh. We live in a very pampered culture. I mean, I don't know what we would do if we were like our dear brothers and sisters right now, this moment in the country of Myanmar, having to forsake their houses because they're being burned up by that military coup and having to uh, run to the jungle and somehow make life happen. We're pretty pampered. I don't know if we could pull that off. But the fact is, in American culture, because we are so pampered, we just pamper our flesh. We give ourselves permission to do all sorts of wicked things that grieve the heart of God. Am I right? And we see sin in others and say, oh, that's so wicked. And we rationalize it in our own life. Oh, yeah, I've been there big time. The anger that we see in others, but we look over in our own life. Whatever the issue is, the bitterness, the resentment, the lust, the junk, we give ourselves permission. All of that's arrogant, is it not? I'm not trying to be unkind, but this is just what our mind does. And we give ourselves permission to indulge our flesh. See, that's all arrogant. God resists the proud, but not just that kind of pride. It, it's also the pride that I'm describing in my growing up years where I was trying actually to do right without God. Oh yeah, I was saved on my way to heaven, but trying to live the Christian life without Jesus, the Christian life, empowering. See, that's arrogant. That's what God was just nailing me over 30 years ago. God resists the proud. I remember reading the story about a little uh, airplane, a little four-passenger plane. There was obviously the pilot, there was a computer expert, and there was a Boy Scout and a preacher on this plane. Well, the pilot turned around and said, you know, we got some engine trouble, and it looks like we're, uh, we're going to go down. He said, unfortunately, we only have three parachutes and obviously four people. But I think I should have one of the parachutes because I have a wife and three small children, so he quickly took one and jumped. Well, the computer whiz immediately spoke up and said, you know, I am the smartest man in the world. And everyone needs me, so I think I should have one of the parachutes. So he took one and jumped. Well, now it's just the old preacher and the little boy, and there's one parachute left. And the old preacher looked at the little boy and said, you know, son, I've lived a good long life. You're young. You go ahead and take that remaining parachute. And with a sad smile, he said, and I'll go down with the plane. And the little boy looked up and said, ah, relax, preacher. The smartest man in the world just grabbed my knapsack and jumped out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good picture of us when we arrogantly trust our flesh. <laughs> we fall. Been there, done that too many times. God resists the proud, but the verse doesn't stop there. Here it is, folks. Giveth grace, is giving grace to the humble. Now, humility is twofold. It's two sides to one coin. The first side is honesty. See, if you don't admit your need, you're never going to go to God for His grace. That's where I was as the arrogant preacher's kid. You know, who needs grace when I can live this thing on my own? Uh, total arrogance. You see, God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, to those who admit their need. Oh, are we humble enough for that? We're Americans. We don't need anything. How deceived can we get? And our place in the world, the stats and where we stand educationally and all that kind of stuff, they are plummeting so fast it's unbelievable, even in the last five years. But the reality is all of that's just propped up human effort anyway. We need God. You see, humility starts with the honesty that, God, I need you. Just like the little child who, 
who, who, who begins to put words together. I remember my little boy saying, I need help. It's a great sentence. And that's what our Heavenly Father is waiting for us to finally put together. I need you. Help himself. But it doesn't stop with just admitting our need. It's that honesty that leads to faith. There's the two sides to the one coin of humility. You see, Romans 5, 2 says, in whom? Jesus. We have access by faith faith into this grace wherein we stand. You see, God gives grace to the humble because the humble are honest enough to say, God, I need you, therefore I'm coming to you. God, I can't, but you can, therefore I trust. There's the access. I can't, you can, I trust. That is what we're talking about. So there's this honesty that leads to faith. Now here's what's neat. What's the step of faith? We say believing, we say dependence, all of those words are true, but can we get more specific as to what the exact step is? Because there are several different steps of dependence. We may cover that on Tuesday night. Monday night we may, may actually go into spiritual warfare, dealing with uh, our position in Christ over the enemy. We'll see how the Lord leads. But on Tuesday we, we may get into the, the steps of faith. But let me just highlight this right here. It's in our text. It says, God resists the proud but gives grace. It's in the present tense. Is giving grace to the humble. So if he is giving it, do you need to ask for it? No. And what do we end up doing? We ask for it. You know what that means? It means we, believe, we don't believe it's there. <laughs> if we're always asking for grace, it means we don't believe he's giving it. Whoa. Now God's merciful when we're asking when it's already there and you can just take it. He's merciful, says, you know, it's already there, so you might as well take it. <laughs> but you can save a little time if you know this. And sometimes that matters. I remember one pastor, we were on a radio broadcast in New York City, <laughs> and we just went over this. I said, you know, if God is giving grace and it's already there, which means you need to take it, you don't need to ask for it. He said, really? This is on the air. He said, I've been asking for it for years. <laughs> but the truth is, you need to take it. You know, if somebody handed you a hundred dollar bill and said, I want to give this to you, if you're smart, what are you going to do? Take it. Take it. I love the immediacy of that answer. <laughs> and that's what God wants us to do. That immediate. He is giving. And when you take that hundred dollar bill, if you're courteous, what are you going to say? Thank you. Thank you. You know what that thank you means? It means you believe you've got it. That's why the Bible says, thanks be to God who is giving us the victory, Jesus. It's the same thing. He's the person of grace. Ah, so God says he is giving grace, the supernatural amen through the spirit of Jesus to do God's will. He's given Jesus. That's why Galatians 2.20 says Christ is living in me. None of that's future. It's present tense reality right now, but you got to take it or you miss out. You don't benefit unless you take and the thank you means you believe you got it. So honesty that leads to taking. And then, of course, you act on it. But no longer is it you trying to mimic motions without him. It's not self-dependent acting. It's God-dependent, spirit-enabled actions. So that now it's not I, but Christ. Not I, but the grace of God in me. So how do we receive? It's the humility. God, I need you. It's faith. I'm taking you because you're giving your grace. You're giving yourself. And therefore, I'm going to act and know that it's not going to just be me. It's your life animating my personality so that there's a supernatural touch to those actions. That, my friend, is mega grace. And when that truth clicks, it changes everything. As one girl said at a camp, a leadership camp, she says, I come to camp every year, I make decisions every year, but it's impossible. And then she smiled and said, but now I get it, why? Because God opened her eyes to grace. That's how it's possible. Supernatural enablement through the Holy Spirit to do God's will. Let's bow our heads for prayer.